Dr. David Schneider. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons at Panorama Orthopedics and Spine Center. I'm the director of the Shoulder and Elbow Institute here. Today we're going to talk about uh, labral injuries and shoulder instability. I'm going to use this model to show you some of the deep anatomy of the shoulder. So this is a right shoulder. Imagine that the deltoid muscle has been taken away and further imagine that all the rotator cuff muscles have been removed as well. So we're left looking at the shoulder capsule and the biceps tendon. If we lift the front capsule and look deeply in the shoulder, what you're left seeing is the articular cartilage deep in the shoulder on top of the humeral head and what would be the articular cartilage deep in the shoulder socket. That's not shown as well in this model, but it would be occupying this entire central region. The thing that keeps someone's shoulder stable is the capsule and the labrum. So deep in the shoulder, the labrum is this material that completely surrounds the shoulder socket. And the labrum is kind of a gristly type of material that's very, very strong and is attached directly to the bone. And when someone dislocates their shoulder, the shoulder ball, and this is a right shoulder, 95% of the time that dislocation happens out the front. That is to say an anterior shoulder dislocation. Sometimes it's a simple subluxation in which it comes partially out and snaps back, but someone knows that an injury has happened. In a full shoulder dislocation, it comes all the way out and won't come back unless it's reduced, and that typically happens in an emergency room. When we get an MRI after that injury, we'll see typically that the shoulder capsule has been stretched and or torn in two. And then classically, deep in the shoulder, a labral tear has happened. This was first described by a German guy named Perthes and described in the German literature, but first described in the English literature by a guy named Bankart. So most Americans, most Europeans still refer to it as a Bankart injury from initial studies done almost 100 years ago. When we repair a bank art tear, what we want to do is reattach the labrum down to the bone. And we do that with an anchor. And in this particular case, this anchor uh, is a soft anchor, and this goes down, down into the bone. And this happens by placing this drill guide and this gets stuffed down into the anchor, down into the shoulder socket. So arthroscopically, we'd, we'd put this guide, we'd drill into that, and then down this guide, we'd slide the anchor, and that goes down into the bone. And you do this in really any type of labral repair, where this would go down into the bone, and then we use these sutures that are attached to that, these very high strength sutures. And that would be for a bank art or even a slap tear. This is what we would use. We know from long-term studies that when someone in their late teens or their 20s and even into their 30s, when they suffer a labral tear, a full labral tear, a full bank art injury with an associated capsule tear, they're at great risk of dislocating again and again and again. For patients that suffer a shoulder dislocation in their 40s, 50s, 60s, they're at a very low risk of dislocating again we almost never have to operating on, operate on them. If it's only a labral tear, we can almost always fix that through the scope. And that really has been the standard of care. And we know that most of those patients do very, very well and only have a one to 5% dislocation risk after surgery. They have full range of motion and can go back to all the activities they wanna do. However, for patients that dislocate their shoulder again and again, they can start getting bony injuries. And in this model, here we see now a left shoulder. And in someone who's dislocated numerous times, as they dislocate, and I've drawn here in black this little defect, we call this a hill sacs defect. And when this happens, when someone dislocates their shoulder, it gets into this little pocket, and the bone just keeps getting hammered and hammered by this very strong glenoid socket bone, this glenoid rim. And it creates this impaction injury, and it makes it easier for them to dislocate the next time. So instead of it being a full dislocation, they just keep falling into this bony trough. And over time, this bony injury gets bigger and bigger, and patients who are in this predicament can dislocate simply by sneezing, reaching for a purse, lifting out to grab uh, food. It becomes really a, a living nightmare. 
So in this case, we have to do something a little more ingenious. And we have some surgical pioneers from around the world that have helped us solve this problem. So if someone has a bony defect of their humeral head, that hill sex defect, or if someone has bone loss of their shoulder socket, we know we can't simply do, no one in the world can do, a simple shoulder arthroscopic operation to solve this person's problem. What we end up having to do is fill those bony defects with bone. The classic way of doing that is harvesting a bit of this coracoid bone. Uh, the old-fashioned term for this was a Bristow operation in which some of this bone would be uh, harvested, cut would be made, transfer this bone, along with the tendons that are attached to that, we call that the conjoint tendon, for the three tendons that attach to that. We transfer that bone down to the side of that shoulder socket right here, along with the tendons that are still attached to that. We do that through an open operation, a small incision in the front after we've scoped the shoulder. We take that bone and put it down here. Now we call that the ladder J procedure, ladder J. So by transferring that bone here, we give someone stability back, and that is a very successful operation. And we do that on patients who have really damaged shoulders, and we can get them back to full activities with no limitations. The typical recovery following both the arthroscopic and the open operation is to go home the same day of surgery. You wear the sling for about a month. You start your therapy about two weeks after surgery, and that therapy program is about a two-month program. At three months, you're pretty active, you have full range of motion, and then at six months, we allow you to go back and do anything you want to do. With our program, and by being very selective about whether we do it through the scope or by doing it open, our re-dislocation rate has been less than 5%. And in our very active patient population, uh, we've been very pleased that our patients have been going back to any type of sport they want to without any repeat dislocations.